India's biggest food leaders, best food philosophies, genius culinary minds converge right here to share their master strokes for success. Welcome to Secret Sauce. I'm Govindraj Ethiraj and let's talk to our first food mastermind, Ranveer Brat. Let me start at the beginning, right? So, uh, like many others in in your profession, you didn't you don't belong to a family of chefs or restaurateurs or hoteliers, and yet you jumped into it suddenly. Tell us about that. Yeah, I haven't grown up into a family of chefs, uh, but uh, like I said, you know, I think all of us have a relationship to food. Mm. From the moment we were born, when we see our moms cook up magic when we come home hungry, to uh, you know, to our grandmothers who just whip up some amazing dishes out of nothing, um, to the neighborhood grocer who talks about food to uh, the temples or the langars where we eat at. So all of us have that relationship towards food. Um, I just chose to pay a little more attention to it. So when, when, did, when was that? When, when did you start first feeling that you had something, you know, a little more perhaps affinity towards food than others? Uh, I started feeling that much later when I was 16. Okay. So till then a lot of... And this of was it, in Lucknow where you were Yeah, in up. Lucknow, in Lucknow. Till then it was a lot of, uh, um, you know, just came with the flow as forced on like, like my grandfather used to take me to the Gurdwara. As a child, you don't sit and pray, right? You go to where the action is. Mm. And the action was where they were cooking langar. Okay. <laughs> so seven years, every Sunday, I spent to where they were cooking langar. Mm. And uh, it just subconsciously, I think it just got ingrained. Mm. I didn't even cook once. Mm. Never. For me, it was like, oh God, every Sunday again. But let's go where the langar is. So you were fascinated by the scale of it or the very yeah, process the of cooking? Okay. At that, that stage, it was the action. Uh, that the space bought, you know, suddenly there's the whole magic. Mm. When you when you go there in the morning at nine o'clock, there's nothing, just a few pots and pans, mm. and at and at eleven thirty, there's food mm. for two hundred people. You know, for me it was magical, mm. and then there was a lot of action into it. That's what what kind of uh, created a connect. But till then, I didn't want to do it. I mean, it was like, yeah, okay, I'm here every Sunday, and mm. and they forced me to cook after that and it came out and whatever I cooked came out well. So at that point, what could have been your career had you not known about your affinity? Like any food? other child, I mean... Okay. Engineer, uh, doctor. Engineer, doctor. Yeah. My dad was an aeronautical engineer. I always wanted to be a pilot. Okay. So till that time, it was like, you know, the world is my oyster. Okay. Yeah. And so when did you start sort of maybe formalizing this affinity? Yeah, that happened when I, when I exposed, got exposed to Lucknow as a city. Hmm. What Lucknow does to you is it kind of uh, shows you different sides of food and food connect, food history, food conversations, um, food people uh, that 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 open a whole new world of uh, what all you can do with food. So how old were you then? Sixteen. Okay. So that's when I decided, yeah, this is something that I can do for the rest of my life. Okay. And and did you tell your parents then, or did they figure it out? And how did that happen? Yeah. So I told them. <laughs> And you know, it was, this is the usual thing, you know what, Nalayak hai to isle, isle uh, Babarji banna chata hai. Just because you, you are, uh, you know, an idiot. <laughs> and also, we, we, are, we, are, we are a family of one of the biggest landowners of our area. Mm. So it was completely unthinkable mm. to do that. So yeah, it came as a rude shock to my parents. And, uh, but then I stuck to it, you know, I was like, no, I can prove that I want to do it. So like, okay, prove it. Mm. So I left home, I worked with, with, with a kebab vendor for eight months just to prove that this is something, it's not, it's not like a teenage dream, this is something I really want so to do. Did you drop out of school or college? Or that no, I had finished, finished 12th then. Hmm. So uh, I was 17, I had finished 12th. Hmm. So I said, okay. So, uh, so I did it for eight months. So eight yeah. months you gave up going to college? I mean, most of your yeah, classmates I mean, yeah, would so have gone on to do graduation. Yeah, 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 I dropped out one year after class 12th. Hmm. I still consider myself Barbie Pass. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I did that. And the parents were then convinced, saying, Achha, this is what you want to do, do it. Uh, so then I enrolled into hotel school. And so what did you learn in those eight months? What, what was the biggest sort of, or the key lessons that you learned? Which I'm imagining would have been some of the world's, or some of the life's best lessons. Absolutely. You know, for me, um, the biggest learning was uh, the wax on, wax off learning. You know, the Karate Kid. Mm. A lot of times, you don't know what you're doing, but you're doing it because somebody says, hey, trust me and do it. Mm. So, um, in, uh, so what I did in those eight months was wax on, wax off, mm. which today makes sense. Mm. You know, because uh, it was a very raw uh, treatment and raw education towards food. 
and if that is your first uh, first interaction with food mm. um, it's it's crude raw in your face it doesn't make sense to you then you like you know but then eventually as you mature as a chef you realize that um, those values that were imbibed in you that getting up at 4:30 every morning mm. to make the nihari or uh, via the kitchen the kind of values that were imbibed mm. in you actually uh, help you grow in in the space so life yeah so this kebab vendor did you i mean did you decide that uh, uh, on this vendor specifically or were you just searching for someone no, this, to work with so or? he was like i said you know i just loved how munir sad was crazy you know he was a completely crazy guy if he didn't like you he wouldn't serve you mm. you know uh, extremely short tempered in your face highly abusive um Yeah, I mean nobody, nobody in the neighborhood liked him. So you walked up to him and said, "I want a job." Yeah, right. so okay. that's what I did. But but I liked him because for me he was in your face. You know, he was like, "You see what you get." Mm. So I knew that you know, my and my my uh, learning in life has been, I'm happier dealing with extremely rude, incourteous, impolite people because I know what I see is what I get. Mm. Um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, and and so I just went up to him and said, "Ustadji," so he says, "Are you crazy?" I was like, "No, no, I really want to do this." He says, "It's going to be the toughest eight months of your life," and they were. But uh, he said yes. So and then you sort of went back to studying, as in you you went and yeah, joined. Yeah, yeah, and then I was. So uh, why did you feel the need to go into so the, formal? So the the whole course? idea of going out and living with Munir Ustad was to convince my parents for formal education. Okay. So once they were convinced. Um, I oh I felt that you know formal education was was necessary um I think it's important to give a structure to your passion dreams uh, and unreasonability mm. and uh, some places uh, formal education gives the structure mm. it it helps it helps you align your thoughts and objectives and your philosophy right so you you joined the taj palace after that in delhi and that was i'm i'm imagining your first job or your first formal job what what was the contrast between the time that you spent with the the kebab vendor versus let's say entering a taj huge hotel. contrast go and i mean <laughs> i you know the first time i entered the hotel school kitchen i i was like i don't even know if i fit in here you know because it's so clean all stainless steel everybody wearing clean clothes I came from, you know, a, a street side, <laughs> you know, a, a hawker uh, and his setup. Who used to cook our cook cook out of his home. So I didn't even know if I would fit in, you know. But then the moment you start working, you realize that it's about the connect between you and the food. Everything else doesn't matter. So by the time I got to hotels, I knew that see, what mattered was my integrity to the relationship between me and my food. Spaces didn't matter. Nothing mattered. So by the time i was convinced that i just need to do what i am doing and stay true to my relationship with food right so did you start was that when you started developing your sort of thesis on food and how you would go about it or was did that come no, later no no you know um for the first two years i was just uh, logging it off from 7 to 12 every day uh, just imbibing as much as i could it was only later when i got transferred to goa goa gives you that time the customers are not in a hurry you know uh, they want to eat the best they don't care they'll order in the morning say I'll, i'm coming in the evening uh, uh, overall it's it's laid back um, there is a break so you can go and sit by the beach and you know put your head in 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 place um, so goa did that for me goa is where i felt uh, that i had a style and i had something to say and expression was key to my personality and i wanted to express myself through food so tell us about the transition from working in a hotel or a chain and running restaurants there which you were quite successful at and at a young age to actually wanting to set up your own restaurant travel and do something perhaps much larger in scale there's only one big difference and the difference is um, accountability when when you're running your own business even if it is a pan shop or a restaurant you're a lot more accountable um i'm not saying that uh, on a job as a professional you're not accountable but um a lot of times um uh, processes become important um the end result sometimes takes a back stage when you when you're working what i learned uh, working as an entrepreneur was 
that I uh, refuse to have treadmill days anymore. You know, that, that would just be saying, you know, you come home and you felt you've worked a lot and you've gotten nowhere. Um, so I learned to be more efficient. I learned to be able to work results backwards and not get obsessed with processes. Understand that processes are um, are a medium to get to where we have to get to. Right. So, so what was the point or the moment where you actually decided that you wanted to move on from being a professional chef to an entrepreneurship? I actually, it was it was not really a conscious decision. So, for me, the when I moved to Boston, my my um, decision was based on the need to cook. Because mm. in a hotel, you know, I became an executive chef at 25. When you're an executive chef, you have 180 people reporting to you. You don't really cook that much. Mm. And I wanted to cook. I said, I want to, I want to be able to cook with my hands. So is this the Radisson? At, uh, this is the, yeah. when, uh, at the Claridge's. Mm. So when I moved from the Claridge's to Boston, so, and I wanted to cook with my hand. And then I said, okay, let's, let's go. Let's uh, go to a place where you can cook with your hand. Mm. And uh, a restaurant was the best place. So from there, you realize that, you know, a lot of what you've been doing in hotels probably is not what you need to do. And uh, you just need a little bit of common sense to, to open and run a business. And I still believe in that. I think everything can be broken down onto common sense. Uh, and that's when I decided, after my first restaurant in Boston, that's when I decided that uh, I'd make a happy entrepreneur. Right. But Getting to Boston and setting up a restaurant, it, I, you make it sound quite easy, but it must have been, I mean, you must have had to reach out to people, put funds together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, it, it was... And why Boston? I mean, I'm just curious. London. Okay. It was just a uh, bunch of friends were opening restaurants right. there, said, okay. hey, why don't you come over and join us? I was like, cool. Right. So serendipity. Yeah. yeah, you know, serendipity. And uh, you're, you're, it was, it's, see, but nothing's easy. So, you know, so while we look back at it and say, hey, you know, it was a great achievement, it happened then and we were dealing with it. Mm. So it wasn't easy, but uh, I mean, the first restaurant shut down after spending $2.7 million on it. Um, bank shut down, it was a rude shock for all of us. Uh, but then you hang on and then you realize the importance of relationships and good people in your life and how in a business relationships are way more important than the money you make. Mm. So it was good relationships that kind of brought me back on my feet. So and, and why believe. did it shut down? I mean, is it something to do with the rest Just itself, recession, or? just okay. bad times, recession, high overheads. We, our rent, including triple net, was 25,000 US dollars. Mm. That was a lot in 2006, 2007. Mm. So bad business decisions to pay such rent, to uh, the, the economy not really supporting uh, that huge space in Boston. Mm. So we couldn't sustain it. But you said you came back and then you set up another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, like I said, you know, good friends who believe in you, who keep telling you, uh, we believe in you more than, than, than you do. And uh, yeah, I know, so one of, one of my friends said, hey, why don't you do a, a menu parallel to mine in my restaurant? I they were cool, let's try that. So there was like a sibling rivalry menu. Mm. That's what I started with and then eventually ended up uh, owning two restaurants there. And then you came back to India and mm -hmm. uh, we'll come to the current in a moment. But so what made you come back? What made you, what was the path that you decided to follow or actually followed? So it was a, it was a, it was a very personal decision. My dad was diagnosed with cancer. Mm. He refused to move to the US. So I came back. He's fine now, mm. you know, touch wood. But uh, that, that's what prompted the return to India. And at this time you were obviously clear you wanted to remain an entrepreneur and no, not really. Not really. For, for me, um, when I came back, it was very unsettling, uh, personally unsettled because of uh, the parents' health. So I said, you know what, I don't want to invest time into entrepreneurship. I'm, an, <clears throat> I'm a hotel chef. It's easy to, for, for me to get a job as a hotel chef. Mm. Let's, get into, let's get into it. Let's uh, get some salary. Mm. Let dad settle down. It came easy to me. Being a hotel chef came easy to me. So that's what I did. So right. I joined the Accor Group in Mumbai mm. as a senior executive chef. Right. And, and, and again, I mean, you seem to have uh, sort of seen the entrepreneurial bug bite you again and then you obviously… Yeah, that's the problem, you know, once it bites you, you can't get away from it, yeah. the entrepreneurial bug. Uh, but I'm, I'm in, in, in a lot of ways, Govind, uh, what I feel uh, is um, all of us are entrepreneurs. See, being a human and having an aspiration means you're an entrepreneur. Mm. How much you listen to that voice in your head before you go to sleep? Mm. Um, I think that's what, or after you have a drink, mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that 
that right. is what uh, makes makes uh, a great right. entrepreneur. So tell us about, I mean, uh, to talk a little bit about on the on the food side. So tell us about what you think of when you actually conceptualize. You know, so what are the two or three things that go on in your mind in terms of who do you visualize? Who's the person eating it or con you know uh, consuming it that you visualize and how? So for me, and you 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 know you hit the nail on the head as they say. For me, the first and the most important thought is who's going to eat my food. Mm. Um, so I never open till I have a very clear picture of my client mm. in my head, and uh, then I create a menu to uh, to create a menu that works for him. Um, so my menu in in Boston is, going, is very different from a menu in Toronto. Mm. Both of them are Indian restaurants, mm. but the, the two different diaspora, mm. the two different demographics. Uh, my menu in Low Parel is going to be very different from my menu in Andheri. Mm. Um, again, um, for me, that's the most important part. Where I am and who's going to eat my food determines, uh, determines uh, who I cook for. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are certain basics that you always follow. Being a chef, it's very, very important. Um, um, but the expression and the language that the food and the menu says has to be extremely relevant and has to connect to that, to that image of a client that you have in mind. So, Chef, what's a food trend that's waiting to happen? I think vegan and vegetarian food is, is definitely waiting to happen. Mm. A lot of South American cuisines are um, just waiting to enter India. Mm -hmm. It's just the fact that most of them are uh, very non-vegetarian is, mm. is what's, uh, you know, taking, why it, they're taking so much time. Um, cooking at home mm. is a big trend, at least in urban India, that, uh, that's, well, it's, it's around the corner, it's not mm. just it's not just waiting to happen. Uh, so you think wine making, at home as opposed to, as opposed to eating out. Okay. The so whole, it's a the taking, to yeah, mm -hmm. the taking pride in you know calling your friends over and saying, hey, let me cook master okay. chef style food yeah. at home. You know, yeah. that wasn't the case for guys taking pride in mm. cooking, calling friends over. Mm. That wasn't the case. I, yeah. That's that's here to stay. Mm. Cooking at home is here and here to stay. And I I give a lot of a lot of credit to you know people like you and food media mm. to be able to do that. Uh, because when you cook at home, no, it food crosses one more frontier and connects to you. Mm. And that's, that's uh, establishing a, an even better relationship to food. Right. So, you've talked about a mistake in a way or a lesson that you've learned when your restaurant in Boston shut down. What are the other lessons that you hold dear, which where maybe you've made mistakes, maybe things have gone wrong, but you've learned from them and now practice the sort of outcome of it? I think the more, the more the business lessons, the more life lessons. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I think yeah. the, the biggest mistake that I've, I've realized what me and others make is going to a business uh, without working capital. Now, restaurant as a business uh, needs to gestate. It's, it's like a child, it needs time, it needs the nourishment to, uh, to grow and start running. Uh, a lot of times we don't do that. A lot of times uh, we just, uh, just say, hey, you know, from day one it's going to make money because the restaurant next door is. Um, so I think that's the most common mistake people make. Uh, they get into the business assuming it's going to make money from day one. Uh, you know, they need to go into it with a little more working capital than they do. So that's the business side of it. Um, in terms of the personal side of it, the human side of it, I think it's very important in the restaurant business uh, to be yourself and stay grounded every day. Uh, because you're, you're as good as the last table you served or the last dish you made. And you know, you never know, you might be the best today and a year later you'll realize that, that nobody's coming to a restaurant. It's very important to, to be, be yourself at all times because then you don't have to fake it and uh, at the same time be grounded. So let me ask as a last question now. So our program is called Secret Sauce. So what's your secret sauce? Or what are your three inputs to your secret sauce? So my secret sauce, uh, first is passion. I think that's, um, that's key to everything I do. If it does not, if I'm not passionate about it, I will not, I will not do it. Um, the second is uh, the strong belief that everything works in the law of common sense. Mm -hmm. That, you know, once, once you can feel that it's approachable, you can break it down. Mm -hmm. So, breaking everything down to common sense, um, doing everything passionately, and third is just getting up and running again every time you fall. I mean, that's my biggest lesson in life. It's, it's the most amazing feeling is to win after you've lost. That's a good note to end on. 
Chef Brad, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Real pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.